Well, thank you, Gerard. And thank you for the nice invitation also to give a seminar here yes. at the university. Um, it's very nice. So, yeah, so I'm Edwin, and I'm from uh, Lund University in Sweden. And you all wonder uh, where Lund is at, because maybe some of you have seen this slide before. Uh, so we are now somewhere here, you see. Uh, and Lund is over here to the top, right, more or less, uh, but in the center. <laughs> of Europe. Yeah, it's here. <laughs> uh, okay, um, so this is the outline. I will give some sort of a background. Um, so then I will talk about corrosion um, and then about electric catalysis and finally some conclusions. Um, yeah, so this is part of the project um, that we have that has to do with stability, corrosion, and dissolution. And uh, this is a problem, for instance, for the anode in acidic uh, electrolytes for uh, hydrolysis to produce uh, nitrogen. Um, the stability of the anode uh, is a problem. And also here, oh, you know, corrosion in general is also a problem. And we sort of uh, tend to associate the same type of processes as we would like to do in surface science to both these problems. <clears throat> um, I will start with corrosion, yes. Um, so we use metals all over the place, right? So in buildings, industry, electronics, musical instruments, and also vehicles uh, like this one here. This is a Swedish train. Um, but what happens over the time is that uh, things uh, grow. We also grow internally. <laughs> um, and then things turn out to look like this instead. Um, and it turns out that um, each nation, 4% of the GDP, um, this is what it costs annually uh, because of corrosion. And also the production of metal, that's responsible for 40% of the industrial greenhouse emissions. It's quite a lot. And 10% of the global energy consumption. So corrosion is a very important topic, mm -hmm. um, of course. Um, there is one thing with corrosion which is in, important, and that's passivity. Um, so some materials should form a native oxide uh, on top of the metal, let's say, uh, which somehow protects the um, material from further corrosion. So a very popular one is uh, chromium oxide, for instance, in stainless steel. So you see uh, here is not so much corrosion, but here is a lot of corrosion. Right. So, but it's this is very important uh, for uh, corrosion processes. So the way you normally test that, uh, you know, on an industrial scale or industrial research is to do accelerated corrosion testing. So you use setups like this, or so like a chemical processes to speed up the process of corrosion because you cannot wait maybe two, three years or so uh, or more to to actually get uh, some idea about the corrosion. And then you can look at the samples and you say, okay, this, this grows more than this, and this is probably because of that, from this and that. Um, so in Lund, we like to do experiments in harsh environments. So we do thermal catalysis, but also electric catalysis and corrosion. Mm -hmm. So you use some uh, kind of an electrochemical cell uh, for these investigations. Mm -hmm. And why do we do that? Well, of course, it's great to see, you know, the initial state of your uh, situation or your material. Um, and then you end up with a final state, uh, which can be excellent, but maybe you can make it better by changing some something. Uh, but what we are interested in doing is to try to look at the process in between this um, <coughs> initial state and the uh, final state here. What you can do uh, is, of course, to quench um, and then hope that uh, you are stable uh, somewhere up here. <coughs> um, so we want to study uh, while the reaction is going on. I'm not, I don't think that maybe uh, this is more time consuming than doing a trial and error type of approach. It's not, it's not clear. But when it comes to the um, um, uh, corrosion of the in electrolysis in acidic media, um, then people have come pretty far in trying to predict how this actually happens uh, on the surface. So these, this is a paper by Herbert Over and Francesca Hess. Um, <clears throat> Um, where they uh, investigate how the ruthenium dioxide one or O surface is actually uh, corroding and it dissolves into the electrolyte. Uh, already um, 1984, 
cold uh, to show that the ruthenium O4 is the corrosion product for uh, ruthenium dioxide. Um, but I think that in, in, in this business, in this area, this community is trying to approach what we are doing in surface science, who uh, have been doing in surface science for quite some time. Um, yeah, so we talked about the passive film, the native oxide. It's very important uh, uh, for the passivity. It's called passivity when there's no reaction in the corrosion community. Um, so when it comes to the corrosion community, they often do plots like this. So here is the uh, anodic potential uh, of your material. This is the current density. And then they measure um, yeah, the current that changes with the potential. This is an awkward way to plot things. And some, so in the US, they even turn this around. And so it's, it's very complicated sometimes. But you have a, an active region. This is where you form the oxide, a passive region where nothing happens as you change the potential and transpassive. Uh, this is when you're starting to dissolve things into the electrolyte. So I will uh, uh, plot it like this instead. Uh, yeah, so here we have the voltage here and the current here, and then we see the active region here. This is the passive region, and then the, when the current is increasing here, um, this is the transpassive region. <clears throat> so here is a typical experiment that you do when you do corrosion science. Um, <clears throat> you this is du super duplex stainless steel, um, and you put a potential <clears throat> like here, 900 millivolts. So you see the current goes up very quickly, and then it goes down. And this means that the surface is passive. So nothing happens on the surface because there's no current being produced. But if you go to uh, one volt here, then you see it goes up, but then it starts to go up like that. And that means that you're beyond the passive region, the trans-passive region is called. Uh, um, so, so, so this is the passive film breakdown this is called in, in corrosion sites. <clears throat> So this is in some uh, typical electrolyte. Um, this, for us, as a surface scientist, this is a little bit indirect, right? You look at the current and then you say, I'm sure the conclusions are correct. But we would like to know what happens on the surface during these uh, type of investigations. So can we measure something else than the current? Yes, one can do that. So we did some investigations on super duplex stainless steels. We use our electrochemical cell. You shoot x-rays, well, at the synchrotron then, um, <clears throat> through this very thin peak uh, uh, wall here. And then we scatter uh, and do some experiments uh, uh, from the surface or from the electrolyte. So <clears throat> here is uh, uh, grazing incidence, x-ray diffraction. We can say something about the, the crystallographic information as we change the potential. This is uh, x-ray reflectivity. We can say something about the film on the surface of the passive field and x-ray for instance then we, if we do that in the electrolyte just above the sample we can tell when the different materials start to dissolve into the electrolyte and so then you get a picture like this um, so you start here in the passive region you have your uh, oxide protective film here you have an alloy layer which is slightly different from the bulk layer this duplex stainless steel and as you go through the, in the passive region, the oxide film is increasing a little bit in thickness, and you start to see ion dissolving from the surface. And then as you increase the potential, more and more things will uh, dissolve uh, from the um, uh, material that you're studying. <clears throat> so this you can do, but there's no direct information about the surface composition from these measurements, according to my opinion. Uh, so now I will talk about nickel, chromium, and aluminum alloys. So these are not uh, duplex uh, stainless steels. So these are materials um, uh, which consist basically mostly of nickel, chromium, and molybdenum, and very, very little iron. <clears throat> and they are used in very harsh environments. So um, I think you know it better as incompatible. <clears throat> um, and there are, of course, various kinds of these materials. <clears throat> so here are two different materials alloy 59 which i will talk about mostly because it's a you know almost like a model system let's say although it's complicated and then there is another alloy here which is called 718 and this has much more iron in it so if you do a you know long term corrosion testing then you see uh, that this alloy corrodes much more than this alloy and this is because there's much more iron in this one here but if you measure the current <coughs> then you have a problem because um, for the nickel 59 
you see that the current increase zone into the um, trans passive region uh, much more before than the 718, even though you know that this is growing more. And this was the question that this company, Alema, had to ask why, what's going on here. <clears throat> and so I'm trying to explain uh, today. Uh, so we did, did experiment max at max four and also at the head of three at Daisy in Hamburg. <clears throat> and this is very complicated because we did many different techniques and we have to do that. Otherwise, we wouldn't understand what we, you know, what we were doing. So we did XPS <coughs> and we did <coughs> also XRF, so x ray fluorescence from the electrolyte. But we also did x ray absorption spectroscopy uh, from the electrolyte. And, and then we did racing incidence, X-ray diffraction, X-ray reflectivity, and in addition also the electrochemical techniques. <clears throat> and this resulted actually in a PhD thesis. So from the XDS, we get the chemistry and thickness of the oxide film. Uh, from the absorption spectroscopy from the electrolyte, we get the chemical state of the dissolved atom. So this is that's very important for us. And from the XRF, we can make a quantitative analysis of the metal dissolution by comparing to known uh, solutions. <clears throat> um, so ambient pressure XPS, I guess most of you know something about it. So here we do it uh, in an electrochemical way, uh, proton in, uh, proton electron out, and we measure uh, the coral levels in some way or another. Um, and this is how we do it. Uh, we put the, uh, the uh, sample, so that's the working electrode, into the electrolyte. We go to a specific uh, potential, and then we actually pull it all up. So it's not a operando situation that we have here. Uh, it, it's, it's done in 18 millibars of water, and then we look what is stable on the surface. <clears throat> so this is how it looks in real life. Here's the analyzer with a nozzle here, it's moving hole. Um, and this is where we uh, put the potential at some, yes, some potential here. And then we lift it up and we go really close and we do the uh, ambient pressure XPS uh, and measurements. Um, the uh, absorption spectroscopy, we did at the PETRA 3, at the beam line called P64. And here is the electrochemical cell that we used here. <coughs> and we have the uh, beam coming in here and we look at the electrolyte, which is in the cell here. And then we do the absorption spectroscopy and get some signature uh, of the electrolyte. And then we also have the X-ray fluorescence that was also at PETRA 3. That was that's a Swedish beam line that also had P64. Um, um, yeah, similar setup as, as before. <clears throat> um, so now we look at the passive native oxide film in UHV. So just XPS measurements from US, UHV. Um, and so what we see is that there is no iron at all that we can find at the surface. Um, we find some uh, nickel uh, metal and some oxides and hydroxides. Um, and similarly in the chromium, it's almost all uh, oxide here, and maybe some hydroxide. <clears throat> and in the molybdenum, we have different oxidation states uh, at the surface. Um, so the conclusion is that we have a, uh, uh, about one nanometer, so between 10 and 15 angstrom thick uh, oxide film on the surface. It's rich in chromium uh, 203, but also uh, molybdenum. <clears throat> um, so this was the first study we did uh, of these alloys here. And you can get this information um, by calculation. So that's all in the, in the paper, how you do this, how you determine the thickness with using the experience. <clears throat> um, and now we put it in the electrolyte. Um, yeah, so this is the chemical behavior, as we saw before. It's slightly different. We have two different uh, uh, pHs here, so 7 and 2. And the uh, pH 7, you see that the um, uh, uh, current increase, it goes uh, uh, before at lower potentials as compared to pH 2. Um, and so it is actually known that nickel hydroxides and molybdenum oxides uh, they are active towards the oxygen evolution reaction. <clears throat> so the oxygen evolution reaction is a main suspect here. And if we calculate it using the NAST equation, what the difference should be in the onset of the oxygen evolution reaction for the different pHs here, um, then it should be 295 millivolts. And that's approximately what we find also. <clears throat> so already now we suspect that there some contribution to the current is because of the oxygen evolution. Um, so now we look at the passive state, what's going on there. So now it's very uh, tedious slide here. 
Uh, this is XPS, and these are the thicknesses derived from the XPS, XPS. So this is the composition here, and there are two different pHs here, and then we are changing the, the potential, increasing it, and we see for both pHs, um, the oxide thickness is increasing. Uh, also, we see that the, for the composition, uh, we see that the, the molybdenum-6 oxide is increasing here, and we can basically confirm this with the X-ray reflectivity, also the thicknesses that we um, expect. <clears throat> and so the oxide grows thicker as the potential is increasing in, in the passive state. Um, it's thin, thinner for pH 2 than pH 7. Now the theory is that at pH 2 the dissolution rate um, is, is, is higher as compared to um, uh, pH 7. So there's like an equilibrium by formation and dissolution. This is what is um, Oh, this is coming from corrosion science. So this is a, let's say, a very uh, active uh, oxide film during these conditions. <clears throat> and there's an uh, enrichment of molybdenum 6 plus at increasing potentials. Right, so now we go to the onset of the oxygen evolution reaction, which we suspect is happening here. <clears throat> and so now we're looking at pH 7 and the XPS again. Um, and we see a potential seven up. So before the onset of the oxygen evolution reaction or the transpassive state, we see we have still metal here uh, for the different uh, species that we have on the surface. If we go to 800 mill millivolts, then the metal disappears completely. And it's almost completely, it's completely gone here in the molybdenum. Uh, so we cannot see it. So everything becomes oxidized at the surface. <coughs> um, and disappears, the nickel even disappears from the surface. <coughs> Uh, and the very similar stuff happens for pH 2 only a little bit later because you remember the oxygen evolution reaction comes, comes a little bit later for the pH 2 one. <clears throat> and so you can compare the molybdenum uh, 6 uh, oxide content uh, with the current density. And you see that follows uh, really closely together uh, for, for in both cases. So, <clears throat> yeah, so um, the molybdenum 6 plus here is somehow connected to the increase in the current also. Now we go to the transpassive region. Um, then, well, we don't see anything else in the XPS because it's all oxidized and the, the metal is gone. Uh, we, instead, we look in the uh, electrolyte with X ray fluorescence, and you see <clears throat> at the, the onset here, start to dissolve nickel into the electrolyte, and also the molybdenum and chromium comes here. And the same happens in pH 2, but a little bit later again. Uh, and so you can, from this, you can calculate, you measure the total current, uh, but you can calculate the dissolution current, which is this red curve here, and then you can extract the oxygen evolution current here. So, <clears throat> so the dissolution starts very close to the onset of the oxygen evolution reaction. It's independent of the pH. And um, uh, the oxygen evolution reaction really contributes to the total. Now we look at the chemical state of the dissolved species. So we measure um, the absorption spectra from the electrolytes so what is dissolving into the electrolyte. So this is the absorption spectra down here for nickel. So this is the K edge here. It, this is black, black lines or experimental lines. And then what we do is that we use references uh, to see what it is. And in the case of uh, nickel, uh, we can see that it uh, dissolves as nickel 2 plus, uh, which is uh, uh, yeah, this curve here, as far as I, I know. So this is the one that mostly is, uh, is, uh, corresponds to the experimental one, so that's uh, nickel hydroxide. Um, the chromium dissolves as uh, chromium 3 plus, uh, so it's this one. And this is unusual because for stainless steels, uh, it is known that chromium dissolves as chromium 6 plus. So that would be this green one uh, here, that, that would be the reference. And you would have this peak, uh, the pre edge peak here, uh, which would be the 6 plus. But we don't observe that in, in this case. And then uh, the molybdenum dissolves as molybdenum 6 plus. <clears throat> so that we don't have the chromium 6 plus. Um, this is not a typ typical transpassive breakdown mechanism because well, the oxygen evolution reaction somehow is involved. And uh, yeah, so it, molybdenum only um, dissolves as molybdenum 6 plus. <clears throat> so, conclusions from this the oxygen evolution reaction is responsible for the higher current density and earlier dissolution of the nickel ion rich in molybdenum. <clears throat> um, so, now I just wanted to visualize this for you so you. 
you you've seen all these spectra and stuff and the oxygen evolution reaction is a suspect here in this case um, so we uh, developed this method which we call two-dimensional surface optical microscopy and then for electrochemistry and so it's basically a microscope uh, there's light here there's a beam screener the light goes down on the surface injected by a camera here and then you look at the change in the reflectance <clears throat> and so we can do that in the electrolyte also because we put a window uh, here on top so we can shine light on our surface um, and this is how this is nice to see right so this is a cell image uh, on the surface of nickel um, uh, 59 uh, nickel iron 59 looks like this in the cell and in our optical microscope it looks like this so there are a lot of grains very complicated surfaces <clears throat> Um, so there are several papers uh, published uh, when it comes to these things. Um, so now this is the reflectance uh, shown here, and this is how we are changing the potential. And here is the intensity of the surface optical reflectance. <coughs> um, yeah, so we are going up, we are approaching the transpassive or the oxygen evolution reaction um, potential, let's say. So you see the reflectance from the surface starts to decrease uh, quite a lot um, as we go up in potential here. And even further as we increase more yeah you see uh, it goes down <laughs> but then all of a sudden um, you can see that it starts to go up again uh, which is interesting and uh, they have to shape this uh, electron because there are lots of bubbles and bubbles are not good for the reflectance measurements let's say <clears throat> um, but then it starts to the reflectance goes up and down uh, like this <clears throat> uh, yeah, so this is uh, this was a little bit of a mystery for us when we saw it first time. So, but then, uh, so, so I should ask you what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, well, so uh, if you take out the surface, then you see there is a brown mushy a liquid, this brownish one. But if you dry it and you put it in the same, it looks like this. Uh, these are so called corrosion scales, these are about 1.1 micron thick. So, these are from the corrosion products. So you can think about a desert, uh, you're out there and then all of a sudden there's a really heavy rain, and you get all this mud and then it dries and then all of a sudden it looks like this, this is, this is my picture of it. <laughs> uh, what you can see also from the EDX here is that uh, from the substrate, um, yeah, there's nickel uh, and so on, uh, but if you look at the scale, there's a lot of oxygen. So these are the corrosion products that have been redeposited onto the surface, let's say. And so what are the oscillations from? Uh, yeah, so it's not so difficult actually. So it's a, just an interference effect. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the incoming, and so you form this layer here, and then all of a sudden you have constructive and destructive interference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so you can calculate this. The thickness just from counting the oscillations here, you get 1.1 microns also. Right, so this was this. So they are active towards oxygen evolution reaction. Uh, so the oxygen evolution reaction coincides with changes in the surface chemistry. Uh, it coincides with the metal dissolution. <clears throat> um, also, uh, uh, we don't see any chromium 6 plus, which is not is different. So the conclusion is that the oxygen evolution reaction is not a passive side reaction, and it induces um, materials degradation. This is not so well appreciated in the uh, uh, corrosion uh, community. So it is known uh, for for uh, <coughs> beach surface science and other type of measurements. Now we come to the electrocatalysis. Uh, again, oxygen evolution reaction stability in the solution, and so we want to have some connection between the cyclic photometry and the surface composition. Uh, so, I mean, everything is known, of course, in the electrochemical community. They know everything from just measuring the current, and this is great. So then we know what we are measuring. Um, yeah, so of course we take the simplest surface of all, and we uh, use uh, uh, sulfuric acid here, and we do cyclic photometry. Um, and this is not a perfect cyclovoltaimetry uh, measurement, uh, but basically you have here the oxygen evolution. So you, you go back and forth with the uh, uh, potential here, and then you look at the current, and there are certain peaks. This is the oxygen evolution reaction here. This is the oxidation peak over here. Um, this is the reduction peak as you go back. So you reduce the oxide on the surface, 
And then this is the hydrogen evolution reaction. And if you do this optical reflectance that I talked about before, that we saw from the nickel alloy, then you see that the appearance, the reflectance is changing depending on where we are along this uh, cyclic potential. Um, so here is the moon, here how it looks like, and I think a few of you have seen this many times actually over the years. Um, and so here we do the cyclic voltammetry. <coughs> um, this is the, the surface here, this is the full crystal, and this is the um, uh, uh, reflectance change as we are uh, cycling uh, this voltage. And you see it's changing from um, um, bright to dark, let's say all the time and it has this particular shape you see there's some shoulders here and then it's flat and, and so on and so forth in the reflectance here so you still thinking okay maybe if we take the derivative um, then we can learn something um, and because each change here should reflect something happening to the surface so if we take the derivative of the reflectance this is the red curve here we can actually reproduce the oxidation peak here and also the reduction peak here uh, and, uh, 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 and and this is of course uh, interesting for us because then we can do optical cycl cyclic voltammetry if we would like to do that. Um, so we also try to look with surface X-ray diffraction, also together with this surface optical reflectance. Um, this is a setup at the Swedish beam line at Daisy. You shoot the X-rays also through the cell here, and then it's, there's a large area detector where we detect the diffractive intensity. So it's different as compared to diamond. You have high energies, 80 kV or so. And then we need to know that on the gold one on one surface, you have the, the, this reconstruction here on the surface, which is well known in our community. So that's the herringbone reconstruction, uh, which you all know, I suppose. Um, and so we do this experiment. So we have this liquid, and then we do the high energy surface diffraction. <clears throat> and surface diffraction, I think you know this is from above. Then you get these Bragg reflections here. If we truncate the surface, um, we get the few scattering in between the Bragg reflections, which are called crystal truncation rods. <clears throat> and so you can also do this. This is from Uta. Uh, also do this from a nanoparticle. Uh, and you see you get rods for each of these facets here. And if you have a surface reconstruction, then you get additional rods in between. They can also coincide, of course, with the uh, CTRs. And if you have a surface reconstruction of the particle, you also get corresponding rods. That's it. And so this is how we do it, the high energy surface X-ray diffraction. Uh, we have a large area detector, which can cover a lot of reciprocal space. And as we rotate the sample, um, then we, um, the, these, these forest of rods cross into the yeah, a sphere or the detector in this case, and we see the uh, reflected intensities uh, from, the, uh, uh, yeah, from, from the whatever is on the surface. Um, so here is the gold 111 in sulfuric acid and then at zero volt potential. Um, and so now we are rotating the sample. These black dots is to protect the uh, detector from the Bragg reflections here. But you see here are these additional um, intensities, let's say, from, from the surface as we are rotating the sample. <laughs> and so it's, it's very nice. And of course, it's very attractive and easier than a diamond. Let's say. Um, so if you sum all these images up, then you see that you have uh, the crystal truncation rods here, uh, and then you have the herringbone reconstruction here. And, yeah, so they are over the place here, and it's a three-dimensional representation of reciprocal space. So if we cut it, um, maybe at low L, then we get a picture like this, and if we zoom in, um, we get a picture like this. And this is the herringbone reconstruction with three rotated domains. Um, and with the CTR in the middle. And if we uh, look at the uh, herringbone reconstruction um, in this potential interval uh, in our electrolyte, so this is always in a liquid, um, then you see that uh, you can make it come and go um, as you are uh, changing the potential on the surface. You can lift the surface reconstruction uh, and then you can make it up. So this is known. For some time. And the model um, that we have for this um, is, of course, that the uh, distance between the uh, misfit dislocations in the herringbone is then reflected in the reciprocal space pattern, uh, which is a simple model. So this is at low potentials. But then, okay, what's going on at higher potentials? 
Okay, so 0. 0.6 volts, right? So we are approaching something that we lift the herring, but it disappears. We still have a crystal fixation, but as the increase the potential here, the only thing we see, of course, maybe there is an increased diffused background, but um, the, the um, crystal fixation was disappeared. Uh, so this doesn't help us very much, and it's the same here, right? We see, okay, it's dark over here and it's bright over here. Okay, maybe there's something forming on the surface. People tell us that the surface is oxidizing. That would be that's right, but then max four, um, the where the sun always shines. <laughs> then there's another beam line called Balder, and this is Estefania and Alfred. Alfred was the one working with the nickel alloys, uh, they're mounting the uh, electrochemical cell. Um, and we do x ray absorption spectroscopy, xanes and exas. Um, and this you showed, I showed before. So, the way you normally use it uh, in, in many yeah, in chemistry and so on is that you you look at uh, yeah, this region here and then you compare to different references to say what you actually have what you're measuring mm -hmm. you can also go a little bit further out and then you get oscillations out here and you get the uh, radial distances between the different atoms in your material um, due to uh, interference effects uh, of the light uh, scattered so the scattered light um so what normally in exas you you just shoot through your sample so this is extensively used in a parameter catalysis uh, of real technical samples to look at how the changes of the, the catalyst uh, so and you can do it in transmission mode or you can also do it in fluorescence mode if you want but as you know we are interested in the surface so what we do instead is that we go to the critical angle <coughs> Um, and, and measure the reflected beam. So the absorption from the reflected beam is then, uh, which is then sensitive only to uh, yeah, five nanometers or so on the surface. And then we look at what's going on here. <clears throat> so if we look at the gold edge here, the M3 edge, these energies here, and we look at the references, then we see that the gold metal looks like this, and um, gold oxide looks like the blue one. We also bought a gold hydroxide uh, reference sample. I think we were scammed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's exactly the same. It was very expensive. Also. Yeah, so this is now uh, what we measure with our grazing incidence. So this is at the low potentials. Then we see this. Um, yeah. So it's metallic, but at 1.8 volts, then we see there is a strong white line. Uh, re representing or corresponding to the oxide formation on the surface. So now we know we have an oxide. Uh, but the good thing is that you can do this, you can take a spectra every two seconds. So you can do real time absorption spectroscopy. So here is the edge here as we are changing the potential in the cyclic photometry. And here's the difference uh, that we have uh, from the absorption spectroscopy. And this is the oxidation peak. And then we see there is a peak coming up here. And then as we go into the oxygen evolution reaction, then we have even more oxygen and then when we go back again uh then we, we come to the reduction peak eventually okay and it disappears <clears throat> so uh, maybe easier way to look at it is to look at the area of this peak down here so that, that is shown here so this is the same measurement uh, up to 1.8 volts or so <clears throat> and then you see okay we form this oxide here but then it stops somehow and then it continues again and forms a thicker oxide and that oxide stays there all the time until we come um, to the reduction peak. And the, so this one is probably very thin, I should show you later. Um, but it's interesting that it's uh, sort of behaving similar to as we saw for the nickel. So it passivates the so, so it's, it oxidizes, but then it stops. <clears throat> it doesn't want to oxidize anymore until we really go into the oxygen evolution reaction. And then we have continued oxidation. So the oxygen evolution reaction really contributes to the oxidation under these conditions uh, that, that should be uh, yeah so sulfuric acid <clears throat> um so you see if we we only go to 1.5 volts up here okay then we form this, this thin oxide and then it goes back <clears throat> uh, if we go to 1.5 volts there's not a big difference still the thin oxide and then it goes back Okay, uh, 1.7 volts, then uh, yeah, we have thin oxide, but it forms a little bit thicker here. You see also the reduction potential is also shifting uh, as we are increasing the thickness of the oxide. And if we go to now 1.8 volts, 
Um, then you see we still have this thin one, but then we form the thicker one, and then it's reduced again. So it's a little bit interesting. Now it becomes complicated uh, because we are combining cyclic photometry with the X-ray absorption spectroscopy and the surface optical reflectors here. And so this is as a function of time, so it's a little bit difficult. Uh, but here uh, is the thin oxide. Here we only go to 1.5 volts. And if we look at the surface optical reflectance, we see that um, the change is 1.5% <coughs> in, in the reflectance, right? Okay, so what's going on here? Surface optical effect, light comes in, it might go through. We are too deep now, it's palladium, but if we just where we go, um, and it bounces off, then it goes out, and maybe it goes into the bark, and then it bounces up, and so on and so forth. Um, and these are called the uh, Fresnel equations. Uh, that you can calculate the oxide thickness as a function of a change in the reflectance here. And if we now take the gold um, <clears throat> and we use these um, values here uh, for the refractive indexes, and we calculate 1.5% change, um, then we get around 5 volts. Okay. <laughs> so now we go to 1.8 volts. Um, do the same. Look at the surface optical reflectance, uh, around 4% change uh, for the thicker oxide. Um, and then we get around 11 volts, something like that in that form. Uh, so this is what we know. We don't know everything else. This is all we know. But there's a thin oxide forming and it stops the oxidation. <clears throat> um, so you can play with this also. So you can change the speed of the uh, uh, cyclic photometry. So from two millivolts per second, 10 millivolts per second. And if you do it two millivolts per second, then you do it pretty slowly. You form the thin oxide here, and then you form the thick oxide here. Um, but if you do it um, 10 millivolts per second, then there's not time enough to form this thicker oxide. Um, so it's, uh, it goes down. You don't form it, you don't see it. Okay, that's, the, that's it. These are the conclusions. Uh, these alloys are active towards the oxygen evolution reaction. Um, the onset of the oxygen evolution reaction changes in surface chemistry. It's not a passive side reaction in this case, because it's active towards the oxygen evolution reaction. And in the gold case, a thin passive gold oxide is formed uh, with the oxidation peak. So the, I guess that's the oxidation potential for gold, uh, but it only forms a very thin oxide. <clears throat> Um, and uh, the onset of the oxygen evolution reaction accelerates the oxidation of the gold. And then, of course, also the dissolution rate, but we haven't measured that, so we don't know. Um, uh, this is the acknowledgement. So, nickel alloys, that was Alfred, and Andrea, he's working with the basic incidence absorption spectroscopy. I mean, you can apply this technique to, to other materials as well, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and then Lindsay has also been uh, very helpful in these. Uh, Experience and thank you. <laughs>